so we have a show in the gallery right now called Telling Stories that is recent work by Leslie Ash and Michelle Kondrich. And um, they're graduates of Hastings College. They, but they both graduated in, in uh, 04, so already 16, 17 years ago, which is hard to believe. <laughs> and the, um, you know, Leslie and Michelle, when they were at Hastings College, were really tight buds. And they decided that they wanted to have their thesis show together. And so they showed in the gallery at the same time. And years ago, maybe two, three years ago, um, Leslie and, or Michelle, I can't remember which, got in touch with me and said, we'd like to do that again. You know, we'd like to have a, have a show together in the gallery. And um, at that particular moment, I, I wasn't exactly the one making decisions about what would be in the gallery. Um, as you know, as I've kind of slowed down my career a little bit, I no longer really direct the gallery. And but that one was in the queue, and it was making its way upward, and it was eventually going to happen. And um, it just so happened that we were able to work it out for now. And it was done on sort of short notice. Uh, I believe that I got in touch with Leslie and Michelle in um, late October, early November. And they wanted to do it, you know, they were ready to do it. But both of them said, uh, the only problem is we're both very busy right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you think about it, when did I contact them? Election season, right? <laughs> 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 it's like when do illustrators really get busy? So, <laughs> we uh, we tried to try to figure out a way to make it easy and and um, you know not too hard on anybody and it could be put together quickly. And this show was was um, came together in a really unorthodox way. They didn't send me anything framed. They didn't send me any prepared pictures. They sent me files, which is what illustrators do you know when they send their work into the new york times or the or the washington post they send in files and all of the pictures were actually printed here at hastings college and they came out beautifully and um i had help from uh, student workers over in the gray center sam burke particularly and um and several others kelsa stouffer i believe and um um and then uh all those things were brought here into the gallery and, and our highly expert gallery crew produced the show. They, they made all the decisions of uh, where to put everything and how to organize it and put the show up. So the old man was able to just kind of sit back and cool his heels the whole time. And uh, <laughs> everything came together great. But um, yeah, I just, first of all, I just want to thank the two of you for having the show here. It's been a fabulous show. And, well, thank uh, you. I just wish we could be there. Yeah, yeah we do. This is the best we can do. Leslie and Michelle and I did an interview for Friday Live, the Nebraska Public Radio um, uh, Arts Program, a few weeks ago. And um, uh, the interviewer, Genevieve Randall, asked me if there was anything in particular that I wanted to make a point about with this show. And, and I told her, well, one thing that really strikes me is this, this is really a women's show. Um, you know, with at least three quarters of our students are, um, are uh, women, of our art students are, and so it really gives me a lot of pleasure to, um, you know, to bring to their attention two women who have really reached the peak, you know, the, the summit of the profession that they're in, despite all barriers that you know, we knew, know still do exist for women to succeed in, in uh, the professions. So, um, and then here on our side of things, everybody that worked on the show, it just so happens was, was uh, one of, one of our, the women students here. So it's kind of a women's oriented show. And then Leslie pointed out that, that um, uh, both of the characters that are the center of her work, are, they're women. So. There it is. All you guys can go home now if you want to. <laughs> anyway, long introduction, but um, I'm just here to introduce um, Michelle. Raise your hand there, Michelle. And then Leslie. 
And then um, behind me are um, Josie Polachek and Sidney Waldron. And they're representing the um, Kappa Pi, the Art Honor National Honorary Society, and also the Hastings College Artists Guild. And um, those two groups have prepared some questions. And, and uh, so our first 25 minutes of question time are gonna come from them and I'm gonna get out of the way. And if, um, if our attention needs to go directly to one of the pictures in the show, I'll take the camera and walk that way, okay? There we go. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for introducing us, Tur. Um, I wanted to kind of start um, with a question um, about the title of the show. Um, I felt like that was a really good place to start. So I was wondering if the two of you could kind of elaborate on why you titled the show the way that you did. Um, Michelle? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that was a discussion between us for a little while. Um, <clears throat> And it was kind of one of those things where the simplest answer uh, is the best answer, which is that uh, for my work in particular, um, everything that I'm doing is telling a story in some way. And as an illustrator, I'm literally given a story that's going to be in a newspaper or magazine um, with which to, to base my art off of. <clears throat> so my job is to, ex um, what's the word I'm looking for? Accentuate the story and draw people into the story while also hopefully adding a little something. Um, uh, yeah, and then, and then I'll let Leslie talk about her work as it relates to that. Yeah, and then I tell a different kind of story, which are just from my like personal, mine are all personal stories. I'm not assigned them in, in general, like the song um, I animated to with somebody else's lyrics but I made it into a story so um, I kind of do these epic personal projects that are narrative and then she does these short and sweet awesome little nugget stories so yeah we're telling stories <laughs> Have you faced and/or overcome as female artists in the workforce? Leslie, do you want to start with that? <laughs> I need to think for a second. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think that a lot of them are a little more sub subdued. I'm not finding the right word, but. Um, I think definitely in illustration, there are fewer women. Um, in fact, there was kind of a controversy a couple of years ago with, there's um, an organization called American Illustration and they have yearly um, competitions for their annuals. You, you pay and you submit work and hope, hopefully you get in. <laughs> um, I have not gotten in yet, but um, a couple of years ago, they made a strange choice, which was in order to highlight the fact that women are often paid less than men, they printed all the women's work in that annual in the back at 70% of the size of the men. So it's just like, um, it's an example of, of where even people, when they think they're trying to do something to make a statement about women's, uh, women's situation in the art world, even that, it's like, why would you, then even highlight them even less in that, in that same way. <laughs> um, and then I think also uh, one of the biggest would be as, as somebody with a child. After having my daughter, there were the, a year or so in where I was working, but I certainly couldn't work as much as I wanted to. Um, and even ongoing, that's just sort of a known thing that there are so many women who go to who go to art school, and then if they have a child, there's a good chance that they they sort of drop out of the art world. And you know, I, I don't think we need to go into details about like why that is. We all probably know why that is, but um, <clears throat> so they're just sort of kind of insidious things that that are barriers that don't have such a clear way around. Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a, an undertone of people aren't meaning to be 
sexist or anything, but like in the illustration, the types that I do like super detailed, uh, really tight, a lot of realistic, like there are just no women who do that. It's almost all men. And, and I even, uh, like I, I sign things L Ash because I kind of don't want to, I don't want them to know my gender. And I probably need to get past that, but I had heard there's a comic artist who I knew wrote, wrote off, awesome graphic novels named Carol Tyler, but she would sign her work C Tyler because she was like, they're immediately, they're, they're not going to be as interested when they know I'm a woman. And I thought that is so sad. I mean, so there definitely are stigmas and even I'm, I battle like, <laughs> yeah, it's a thing that you have to deal with and know, but I think our challenge is just like, well, we're just going to be awesome and prove that, you know, we can be just as good as those dudes. <laughs> I got a message in chat so for y'all to come a little closer. Um, as artists, we all have times that we feel blocked. Um, what do you guys do during those times to keep yourself making work and how do you push past those kind of mental blocks when you're working? Um, I mean, really like just making yourself work. I mean, sometimes I have to just be like, you idiot, just work. Like you have to force yourself. And the most tangible example I ever had was I had this show in a gallery in Cincinnati and it was uh, it was commissioned and I got paired up with this artist I didn't know. And uh, we were gonna cover the gallery top to bottom with little illustrations, like no wall, no ceiling, everything. And it was, and they gave us a year to do it, which we needed. And I was so like jammed up with anxiety and I didn't know what to do that like six months passed, seven, eight, and I was not doing anything. And I'm like, you have to do work for this. And so that was the hardest thing I've ever done. I was just sat down and like, it was like physically painful to make the work, but pretty much after like a week or so, it just started to flow. And it was just weird because it was like a tangible, like, Psh! so really just making yourself do it and know that this, the, you know, the work at the beginning is probably not going to be great and it may not end up in your final, but it's totally worth it just to push through. And like, you can give yourself an art artistic friend, you know, I could say, hey, Michelle, give me a, give me an assignment, you know, and anything, or uh, you could do a, like one of these challenges, like 12 self portraits in 12 hours, or, you know, like uh, um, exercises, really. Yeah, I mean, historically, I feel like, um, I've been really bad about, like, if, if I'm working on, if I want to do personal work and Leslie can attest the number of times I've emailed her and I've been like, can you be my pretend art director so that I have something to work on? <laughs> um, but for me, I feel like the whole process is condensed so much because my deadlines typically with editorial are so short. Um, they can be anywhere from same day to a couple of weeks. Um, but for, and then particularly during the pandemic, it's been really hard coming up with ideas. And I think, I mean, the best advice I can give is, is to be willing to make bad work, be willing to, you know, one of the first things that I learned getting into this career was you just have to put the bad ideas down on paper to get them out of your head. Sometimes if, if you, even if you know it's a bad idea, if you don't just put it down, then it's gonna be there like, oh, maybe I can make it work. You just gotta put it down. Um, and I, I live with, so my husband is actually a poet. So I've experienced um, a couple of different, my own creative block and his creative block. Um, and so it's interesting to see how people in different um, disciplines handle it, but the two of us handle it very differently. I'm, I'm just like a plow through. Well, sometimes because it's just, uh, it's due. <laughs> the client is waiting for the, the sketches or the final, so I have no choice. So I have to also learn to just accept imperfection. There's a there's a a quote or a line that people use. It's like uh, done is better than perfect or something or or something along those lines. <laughs> Both of those were excellent examples and advice. Thank you so much. Um, 
Could you outline some of the steps that you've taken or made in your career as an artist ever since graduating from Hastings College? Sure, I'll, I'll go first there. Um, mine was certainly not um, a straight line to illustration. Um, when I left Hastings, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be involved in the art world. I also wasn't sure I wanted to be involved in that, in the fine art gallery world. Um, and it took me a lot of years um, to come across the, the concept of illustration as a career beyond just like children's book illustration, which is what a lot of people think of. Um, I stumbled on some podcasts, particularly um, one called Escape from Illustration Island. Hopefully the archives are still up because he's not making more of them, but, and that was really what gave me the, um, the idea, the confidence and the understanding that I could pursue this career on my own, that um, I just had to build a portfolio and, and put it on the internet, you know? I mean, when, when Leslie and I were in college, there was the internet, of course, but it wasn't anything like it is now. It wasn't so robust that you could find anything so easily or that you could put yourself out there so easily. Um, so I feel like for my career, just growing via social media, via, via putting myself out there over and over and over again um, is the most concrete thing that I have done, if that made sense. <laughs> um. Uh, when I graduated and we graduated in 2004 and um, as soon as I graduated two weeks later I moved to New York and she moved to Los Angeles um, and we both did kind of our own art and we um, I mean I don't think either of us were making anything substantial we mailed back and forth we did like collaborative art Remember that? So ugly. I still, I'm sure I still have some of it. <laughs> <laughs> but like we stayed busy, like, you know, doing projects like that. And then um, she moved to New York and together we started taking adult education classes at School of Visual Arts and Pratt Institute. And we started to kind of um, get back into it. Not that we were done with art. It just, we just didn't have time. We were trying to pay rent in LA and New York and there wasn't time to make a lot of work. Um, but so taking those classes at School of Visual Arts, um, we met a critique group and we started meeting with them. And I, I got involved with this uh, underground street art group called Antagonist Art Movement. And we showed it a few places in New York. And then I, I just kind of got to this point. I think, I don't know if you've seen it. There's a movie called Beautiful Losers. And I watched it. And when I, when I left the theater, I was like, I'm going to grad school. Like, I don't know why, I just had this kind of calling moment. And so um, I, I left New York and went to grad school and uh, really found my voice there. And then I did a residency in Budapest. Um, and then after that, I moved back to New York and um, worked in the fashion industry. But I really felt like grad school got me to a place where I knew who I was and what I wanted to do. So I've just been working on like, these five different epic projects uh, while I was doing my full-time job and just uh, taking on the work that I wanted, not taking work that I didn't and yeah, continuing to learn, meet new people. Yeah. Great. I think those are really important answers specifically for me to hear kind of um, as I'm in my second half of college, I guess. Uh, seeing all the options that are available. Um, what are some, oh, sorry, how do you address the imagery within your work um, and all of the important topics that you talk about through your work? Um, I think uh, for me, I mean, a lot of the imagery and um, subject matter that I'm covering, like I've said, is, is given to me. Um, so I think on a very basic level, one thing that I am trying to do is avoid <clears throat> cliched imagery as much as possible. I mean, it's especially if you get work that's for like business related magazines, it's like how many, I'm not gonna draw a man in a suit climbing a ladder. <laughs> so not, you know, trying to 
think of interesting ways to portray topics that have been tra- portrayed a million times, like whether it's about money or um, I'm trying to think of off the top of my head, if there's something that's in the show that is a good example of that. Um, can't think of anything right now, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So for me, it's just trying to think visually outside of what has often been done in the past, but that will also read clearly because that's really important for me is that people need to be able to understand the work very quickly. Um, You know, I try to step back and look at thumbnails and make sure that it is readable um, from far away or from a quick, quick glance. Um, Yeah, I hope that answers the question. And I'm kind of opposite as far as just because I'm not doing the same kind of illustration she is. I want people to look at it and go, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like kind of wonder about it. And um, if even if it is like a really boring image, just kind of a straightforward, I, I like to infuse some Easter eggs in it. Like even if it's just for my entertainment, like I make the uh, numbers relevant or I put like sacred geometry in there somewhere just like it just makes me feel like it has more meaning and I think it enriches the pieces even if people aren't picking up on exactly what I added into it absolutely that was super helpful and everything um what are some key themes that you hope people take away from your work and how do you hope that your work affects people um I mean I usually try to just touch a like really base human emotions. Um, I want people to connect with my work. Every project's different. So, but um, like my children's book, I want that specifically for kids who maybe have a lot of anxiety and get nervous and feel self-conscious. Like I want them to take away from that book. Like, I don't care what other people think. Like I, I can be brave and I can overcome this. So you know, I have really specific intention for what I want people to take away from that. Um, it, yeah, and then just depends. Some some stuff I make, like installations, I just want to amuse people and, and let them have fun and feel immersed in art. Um, I don't know, Michelle. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, related to that, I feel like my more personal work, so a lot of the portraits that um, I've done, um, particularly some some more recent ones um and just in this year i just did one of amy sedaris i did one recently of david diggs like in my personal work i feel like i really am just trying to have fun and i enjoy pop culture and i like to to celebrate it and celebrate people within pop culture that i think are really really smart and talented and doing more than than just like Pratt Falls or something um with with my editorial work with with each piece i want people to take something different away from it based on the tone of the article um, based on the subject matter um but i will say that on a more general level things that i things that i just like to portray i i like to portray feminine bodies just generally that's and in fact, with, even within my portraits, I'm like, I should probably do a guy <laughs> every once in a while. Um, and I, I get hired a lot for, um, I guess you could say some like lifestyle kind of illustration, but also more opinion work. Um, so, so yeah, there's not so much one thing. I think. I get hired based on the look and feel of my work, but also on the ideas that I have. And I can't, I don't have like a concrete explanation of the types of ideas that I have. I feel like I go back and forth between more narrative and more conceptual concept ideas. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more, awesome. Um, So earlier you guys kind of mentioned that you had done some collaborative work together. Um, and there was a question about why exactly you started showing your work jointly, specifically in this show um, and before this show as well. I mean, <laughs> Michelle, me and Michelle met in 2000 in Jerome's design class. And pretty much ever since then, we've just been like best buds and, and 
um, artistic colleagues. So we always wanted to show together because our work, our work does kind of like play together well. I think, you know, if we had been there in person, I think we would have done something like really weird and collaborative and large. Um, but it, and it's nice too. And I hope, I hope this for you guys too, to keep in touch with your artistic friends. Cause like me and Michelle have an awesome relationship now where we text each other every day and send each other what we're working on and be like, Hey, what do you think about this composition? What do you think about this? And you know, we're, it's really nice to just be like, get a real answer. She'll be like, that composition does not work. Or what is that? And we, ex we expect I an immediate answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, not offensive. it's not offensive. So it's really nice to have a colleague where you could just be like, I mean, I guess we just trust each other <laughs> to give each other good advice, but so yeah, yeah I mean, we play together. Well, like, like Leslie said, I think that our work, our styles are not, nobody would ever confuse them, but I think that they work well together. And I'm, I'm sure that has to do with, at least early on, our influencing each other. Um, uh, like she said, we used to mail each other. We had this whole series. I don't know if anything ever got finished, but it was kind of a fun way to keep in touch and to keep working, even though we were both like working regular jobs and all this. Um, but we would do a part of a piece, mail it away, like put a date on it and mail it. And then the next person would just do something else to it. And it was a fun way to like not be precious about the artwork. Um, and yeah, I think it's just that continued relationship or our shared past at Hastings, our shared experience with, with Turner and with everybody else at the, at the gallery there. Um, it just seemed natural, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm back. Um, I see we've got about 10 people with us online in Zoom. But next door, there's a room that's got about 20 people in it. And um, that's hey, where... <laughs> Um, Dr. Chris Strickland is over there with these these other students, and um, they, you know, we all kind of miss having some public events, right? So this is our semi-public event, and um, you know, I'd like to see if there are any questions that could come from that room. Chris, are you there? We're here, but there's no questions right now. Well, I tell you what, um, Michelle mentioned that um, she was prepared to um, post our website up here, you know, we can share, share screens. And uh, I think I know how to do that. And Leslie, you may have something that you want to cast up on the screen too, but Michelle, would you like to do that now? Um, oh, sure. I mean, I was just saying that I can, if I, if we're talking about a specific piece, oh, it's currently disabled. It says me, me sharing my screen. Because the host is disabled. Not able to do that, eh? No, sorry. <laughs> Unless I don't know if you can change it mid Zoom or not. Well, um, you know, one of the things that I can do is is um, well, I can I can give uh, Sydney and and Josie a little bit more opportunity to ask questions, but I've got a couple on my mind. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, I've I've been itching to talk the whole time, right? <laughs> you know me. Um, there, come on in, Jordan. Okay. Um, so everybody who's an art major and a lot of people who aren't know that the, the thesis in the art department is, most students say it's the hardest thing they did at Hastings College. Not just, in, not just the hardest thing they did in the art department, but possibly the hardest thing that they did at Hastings College. And um, both of you, I can still remember your theses very well. And, but, um, you know, there are 
people here in this building who are thinking a lot about what they're going to do for their theses and you know whether whether it's actually worth it to go to that much trouble. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience was with the thesis and you know how that affected you when you went out of Hastings College? Um, I mean, I, I think I had the same issues in grad school developing my thesis. I went through a lot of different ideas and like, I think I was trying to, to force some ideas at first that like, I didn't really care about. I think I just, I thought, oh, this will be smart or this, but really ultimately I just ended up like following my heart, just kind of like, I, I was really looking at what are my recurring themes? Like, oh, I'm always making work about this. There's everything kind of has this current of undercurrent of, of something. And so, I mean, for me, I guess it just kind of like came naturally, like it was a lot of work and it was a lot of like futzing around with different things, but it just kind of dawned on me, but it was the same as that artist block thing. It was like, you kind of just had to keep working and working and working. And eventually you're like, oh, I have a body of work that means something. Yeah, I think I uh, had a similar experience. Um, <laughs> looking back, I feel like my thesis experience is kind of like, my is similar to my career experience in that uh, I didn't really know what I was aiming for, at least initially. I didn't really know where I wanted my work to be focused. Um, and this is before I had decided that illustration was gonna be the, the career path that I would follow. Um, and looking back at the at the thesis show seems pretty obvious that that that, that would have been the way. I, I could have gotten a head start much earlier than I did if I had just done it right out of school. But um, you know, my work focused a, a little bit on pop culture, a little bit on comics. It was just it was kind of yeah. I, I mean, I think my thought it was exactly what Leslie said about about following your heart. Like, even if you think it's going to be weird, even if you think it's nobody's going to get it, like if you put yourself in it, if you put your heart into it, you're going to come up with a body of work that is cohesive, it, even if it doesn't feel cohesive to you at the time necessarily. Um, and that's something that's been a hard lesson, which is that no matter what medium I'm working in, no matter what the subject matter is that I'm working on, people can tell that it's my work just by, you know, the, the endless conversation about style and how do you find your style? Well, you don't, it just, it is you. So just, yeah, follow your heart, like Leslie said. Oh, Turner, if you're typing, I think you're muted. There we go. When you <laughs> left here, did you feel like you were prepared well? What did you still need? I, I think everything I needed was was from me. It was something that I was not providing. Um, I think also at the time, like I mentioned, it's, you know, 16 years ago that we graduated. Um, and I just didn't know at the time what kind of career was open to somebody in illustration. I, I was like most people thought it was just children's book illustration and that's the end of the story. Um, and so I feel like I had to go on this like wandering journey for a while to find out, to not, um, be telling myself that I have to have something big to say. I have to be in the fine art world. Well, I had to discover that there was another way for me anyway. And I, th I think Hastings always really nourished. Like, I mean, you guys were so great, <laughs> like, like so supportive and like whatever I wanted to make. And a lot of it was just crazy and, weird and you know not that good but but it felt like everybody was supportive and I really felt like I grew into who I was as an artist because I felt that support and and encouragement so I mean I, I never felt lacking like you know there's a lot of kids who go to big art schools and they come out like incredible and but like I'm not I don't envy that like I I really like the experience I got at Hastings I think the liberal arts education as a whole is really nice because yeah. you just, you get to touch on everything. Um, and then even just 
even though Hastings is a small little school, you know, we had this great glass studio. We had to glass blow it. Like who gets to do that? And I, like Leslie said, we were su supported in being able to try out a lot of different things along the way. I only regret I never tried printmaking. I'm sorry, Turner. I wish I had done that because now I'm interested in it. <laughs> well, you can come back anytime. Okay, will do. <laughs> you know, I think that um, Sydney and Josie still have a whole pack of questions that they can they can ask. And so why don't I put them back to work? Okay. There you go. So we had a question about your perspective um, and why you feel like your perspective and what you have to say is important for people to listen to. Well, for me, I think it's, it's less that my personal perspective is important as much as everybody's different perspective is important. That sounds really like I don't know. It, I think especially in illustration that part of what makes it so wonderful is that all these perspectives are, are represented. People come, my clients come to me for my ideas and the way my work looks. Um, but if I was the only person working, if, if newspapers and magazines, it was just my work, then, then what's, a, that's no fun, <laughs> and B, then you're getting one perspective of one person. Um, and so I, I think of it more as being a part of a more global perspective and contributing without needing it to be like, just about me. <laughs> and Not to say that it can't be about you. <laughs> mine's just about me. But I mean, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, other people would find my perspective important, but, but it's important to me because my art is very personal and it's, it's therapeutic and an expression. And I guess I'm hoping just some of the issues I hit on um, are personal for me. I'm hoping that I can connect with other people and they can also feel like, oh, like I'm, I'm not alone in that way. Like you, you get me. And um, so I would, I would hope my work is important in that way, just that I'm able to help people feel like they're not alone in certain things. Um, I think, um, just to add to that, um, it's, this is less about my perspective, but what I do think is really important as an illustrator, um, is this idea of representation. And I work really hard, um, to make sure that I'm portraying a, not only a diversity of races, but bodies and ages. And, and sometimes it's not always possible because I do get clients that'll say like, oh, can you make that person a little younger? And that's awkward. <laughs> um, I, in my, in my personal work, and if it's, if I'm drawing something in which it's just a person, doesn't have to be a specific person. Um, I, I'm always trying really hard to push against that, the standard of what a person is or is not. Um, and I, so I think artists and illustrators in general have a responsibility to, to do that whenever they can. Um, what questions do you guys ask yourselves while you are in the studio or while you're creating new work? Um, I mean, a lot of times the questions are did I think this through enough? Because I tend to just dive in. And sometimes I'm like, give this like 10 more minutes of thought before you waste seven months on it. And so that's always a big one. Like I struggle with planning ahead. Um, and then another one, just on a bigger level is like, does this serve a purpose? Like, what is the point of this? Does it deserve to take up space on this planet? Um, at least, is it at least fulfilling me and do I want to be doing this? That's what I think of. 
I think a lot of the questions that I'm asking myself have a lot more to do with imposter syndrome than anything else. Like, uh, particularly um, if it's a larger client, like, is is this smart enough? Is this what they hired me for? Um, but I think then when I'm into the work, um, my questions are very, they're really about the execution, um, kind of technical questions about like, is this color scheme working? Leslie can show you probably dozens and dozens of texts where I sent her like four different choices and like which of, which of these colors is working or any of these colors working. Um, so, and then going back to what I said before, when I'm coming up with concepts, it's about like, is, am I, am I doing something new? Am I, am I providing a different perspective? Am I representing somebody other than myself, essentially, um, as I'm filling these scenes. May I ask one? Yeah, go for okay. it. <laughs> so um, where, I'm, where I'm sitting in the gallery right now, I'm watching Leslie's animation out of the corner of my eye. And um, I think this is the first time that we've shown such a thing in our gallery. We've got the animation and we've got developmental drawings that we're part, we're building up to the animation. Leslie, can, can you talk about how that project happened? Yeah, um, it, there's a band I like named Barnaby Bright and that was, that song was a demo of theirs that they hated and they didn't want to release. And I also hated it at first, but then for some reason I just started to like connect with it. And a lot of my art, almost all of it is music driven like it comes from being inspired and I just kept listening to it and based on my iTunes count I listened to it 470 times before I decided to make an animation out of it um I get very fixated <laughs> on things and that was <laughs> uh so the idea actually started in 2013 uh and then I worked on it off and on but pretty much when lockdown started it was just like animation time so um, the band did not know I was doing this <laughs> at all. I just did it on my own. And then I thought I'll just show them when I'm done. But um, I put about 2,600 hours into it. Um, I didn't have a vision, really. I just took it little by little. Um, it's about, it's 6,800 frames, individually hand-drawn frames that I uh, composited in After Effects. But I showed the band, they liked it, and it's gonna be released in a couple weeks and um, go to some film festivals. So I'm super excited about it. And the debut is in your gallery. That just goes to show you that you just put your work out there. Like, don't wait until everything is perfect. Like, if you want a career in, in art other than just traditional gallery work, just make it and put it out there and then the right people, well, whether it's people who will pay you or not, I don't know, yeah, but I mean, your fans was, will, like people who like it will find it. Yeah, it was just something I wanted to do. Perfect. Um, earlier you both kind of touched on variety within your work um, and how you kind of change up what your drawings look like. Um, and I was just kind of curious how you find that balance between variety and cohesivity um, of your work. I'm sorry, what was the last part between variety and what? Cohesivity. Like okay. Cohesiveness. Um, I mean, like Michelle said, like our inherent style is kind of there, but I mean, I do have a lot of different styles and, and she does too, just based on uh, the project. I don't know. I guess it just depends on the mood and, and what I'm going for. Like the children's book stuff there is, is really not my, my usual style at all. I, I usually do this really like uptight cross hatching and like, I just didn't do it at all for that. Um, but I feel like if you looked at that next to my cross hatching pen and ink stuff, you would be able to tell it was the same artist. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, um, for me, 
some level of consistency is important um, so that my clients have some idea what to expect. Um, but when I started doing the portraits, that was kind of, um, you know, I hadn't really done a lot of personal work in a long time. Uh, and the first one I did, uh, actually I did, I did a piece based on the movie Midsummer. Um, and I had so much fun doing that one. I don't think that one is in the show, but, um, the, the piece called the favorite, which is the, the queen, um, was another, was like the second the portrait sort of style illustration I had done. Um, and those were, these are just personal things where I got to um, be a little bit more painterly. And some of that has to do with digital tools, um, catching up to things that can actually look like real oil paint. Um, I, I specifically use Adobe Fresco a lot on the iPad. Um, the, the live oil paints are really nice. I started using those with some of my portrait work. Um, and so that's, that's been really fun to, to play with, to add that painterliness back into my work. When I was in college, I loved oil paint. Now I lived a very transient lifestyle for a few years. And then now I have a child, I can't have oil paints just sitting out, you know, anywhere. So it's fun to be able to bring some of that back in to experiment with. We had a student come in with a written question um, from our room up there. Um, and it is, how long did it take you to feel stable in your career, both personally and financially? Oh, could you repeat that? I had trouble hearing it. How long did it take you to feel stable in your career, both personally and financially? Michelle. Okay. Um, for, it, it took me a long time. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I think that I was basically working from the ground up because I, after I graduated, I, it was several years. I'm trying to think it was like six more years before I decided that this is the career path I wanted to pursue and started building a portfolio. Um, and so especially financially, mm -hmm. I, so I've been doing this for about 11 years now, almost. Um, the first three or four years, I feel like I really made like nothing. Um, I was building my portfolio. I was trying to figure out where to focus my work. Um, so that, that took a lot of dedication to just keep working, keep getting better. Um, and I think around the time probably that I started getting get I started being more financially stable with the work is also when I started to feel more personally stable. I think that's because in this career path, there's, there's some validation that comes along with making more money because you feel like, okay, people keep hiring me. Oh, this person hired me and then they hired me again. So I must be doing something right, you know? Um, and so in that way, it's kind of a, kind of a snowball. Um, but it's definitely something that takes a lot of patience and don't, if you decide to pursue a path like that, don't be afraid to take on, I took on part-time jobs. I took on full, I'm full employed full-time also currently. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a big thing. Like when, I mean, when I was living in New York, like I would have had to make a lot of money on my art just to pay rent. So I've always had a, full-time job. I don't right now. Um, but up until six months ago I did. And for, for me, I like that. I like having, cause, cause you know, making art is a very solitary practice. It's, it's not social. So I always liked kind of having like a full-time job during the day, have my community of work friends or whatever, but then I do art separately and, and I bring in, you know, money from Etsy or commissioned projects and stuff, but the bulk of my money does come from just like my day jobs that I do teaching or office jobs or whatever I've done over the years. I think, unfortunately, we live in a world where, I mean, everybody's wage, nobody's wages are high enough except people at the, the tops of corporate uh, ladders. Um, but art is undervalued. Um, arts of all kinds, I would say, you know, people are out there making 
logos for like $20 on Fiverr or whatever. And it's like, don't, don't undercharge. <laughs> That's sort of a drumbeat in the illustration world, which is like, you know, charge what you're actually worth and don't, don't work for free unless you just want to. Sorry, that was a really random just insertion, but it's, it's, yeah, it's important. Definitely helpful to all of us, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Michelle, you had mentioned how in college you liked um, oil painting a lot. Both of you now work digitally and make digital art. How do you think that affects your art and what impact does it have on your process? Um, it made my process so much faster. <laughs> So I feel like, you know, I, for a long time, I was inking on paper and then maybe coloring digitally. Uh, and then now, now that I have a separate tablet, the, the technology has advanced such that I can ink in, you know, a million different kinds of pens on the same machine. It's just, I don't have to scan anything. I don't have to, uh, it, I don't have like a million different little files here and there. It's all, it's just so compact, which is amazing. I can work wherever I want. Um, and I think it's allowed me to experiment with color in different ways that I wouldn't have been able to before. Um, I mean, of course, if you paint something and then you scan it, you can play with the color digitally, but having that control over like every little layer, of course, it, then it gives you the opportunity to messed with something endlessly <laughs> uh, but mainly speed i would say um this the speed at which i can work means that i can take on more work which means i can be more financially stable yeah i mean i i liked oil paint and ceramics and stuff in college and i you know getting my hands dirty and doing all that but i think um and i still do some of that um now that I, I live in North Carolina and have studio space, I've gotten, I have more room to work with like toxic spray paint and stuff. But um, uh, yeah, I like the control I have digitally. And I definitely know that my, you know, learning physical arts, the, the basics um, inform my digital art for sure. And then me and Michelle both have our iP iPad set up with a, a cover that's called paper-like. So it feels like paper. So um, it is sort of mimicking a real physical drawing too, which is kind of cool. But I must admit <laughs> since, and I mean, we talk about this sometimes since I have become so digital and become so used to undo buttons, my- You tap paper <laughs> to double no, tap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I were to sit in drawing class with you guys right now, like it would not look. <laughs> human <laughs> like I my drawing skills have faded a bit because of my reliance on the undo button yes. um, how do you think about and talk about your work um, in comparison to other contemporary illustrators that make work that's similar to yours that's a good question I mean I have uh, my artistic heroes, um, Chris Van Allsburg, who wrote Jumanji and the Polar Express. He is like my absolute favorite. And you probably can tell from the black and white style of my um, kids book drawings that he's a big influence. So, I mean, there are people like him who are just heroes to me. And I'm like, oh, one day I hope I, hope I can be as good as him. Um, I mean, I try not to compare myself too much to other artists just because that can make me feel bad. And I mean, my style is what it is and I can try to improve uh, myself as much as I can, but um, I try not to get into a loop of looking at other people's work and thinking, oh, they're so good. And cause that just is like toxic for my creative process. Yeah, I mean, I think there there's such a wide array of artists working in, I mean, in illustration and in fine art, of course, but um, I think, like Leslie said, you know, comparing yourself too much to others is can really be damaging um, long term. So I think 
my goal is to is to look at contemporary illustrators around me and figure out where I fit in between some of them um, so that there's a reason why somebody's coming to me for my work as opposed to this other person whose work might sometimes look a little bit similar. Um, but at the same time, I think being able to recognize the people that work in a similar fashion to you is really important. Um, firstly, so that you know what else is being created so that you're not inadvertently um, doing what somebody else is doing. But also for me, I've had instances where I've been in the middle of a project and for some reason it just, it's not, it's not working for me. I need to, to back away from the project and I've been able to look to other illustrators and say, hey, I can't continue this project for whatever reason. Our work is somewhat similar. Would you be interested in taking this on and continuing? So I think it's a, it's kind of a, a back and forth between finding where you're different, but also not necessarily fighting against where you're similar because there's, there's always gonna be somebody who's similar. So it's, it's about finding your differences. Well, we are pulling up to the seven o'clock hour here. And uh, so I just wanna say thank you. I just wanted to ask what, what are you guys' um, areas of focus? Like what are, what are the art students mostly interested in? Are you talking like us specifically? Yeah, like, you know, painting, illustration, what do you like? Um, so my emphasis right now is in sculpture. Um, okay. I've gotten a job as a shop assistant, so that's kind of allowed me to spend more time in there, um, doing, working on some more 3D stuff, which I think is really awesome. And on the flip side, where I love two-dimensional stuff, specifically painting, um, watercolor is even more specific is like my emphasis on what I love most about this. Oh, cool. Turner, I, I, have, I have a question for you. What What is teaching been like with the advent of all these digital tools? Are you guys, you know, when it comes to, to drawing class or, or painting class, are you, do you try to keep mediums pretty like straightforward and traditional so they learn them first? Are they, is there mixing between the two? I'm just curious what it's like as a student with that. You know, I think you would find that if you go in the painting studio, wouldn't feel very different from what you remember of a college painting class, printmaking studio, the same. But, you know, in all of the studios, new technology from the digital area has, um, you know, it comes and goes. So now sometimes we make uh, plates for um, intaglio or for relief in the, fab lab, you know, in the 3D printers and the mm -hmm. laser cutters and that kind of thing. So it's just an extension. You know, most things that you would see in the printmaking studio, Rembrandt would know what to do with them. But then we've got this other stuff, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, got electric wires running into it that can just be an extension to it. And I think every studio has that kind of thing going on. The core of our department, you know, um, I don't think it really feels all that different, but there, there, are, there are these new, new little wings, you know, that are uh, attached to it. And um, we have people who are doing things that are really phenomenal, you know, that are primarily digital. Mm. But there, those those people are educated in drawing and painting and sculpture, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I, it it doesn't feel contradictory to me in any way. It just feels like an expansion that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. I used to fear that digital art was just going to take over and it was going to make traditional studios like ours seem, you know, obsolete or useless, but it hasn't gone that way at all. Well, shall we call it an evening? One, one thing, real quick, before we completely all leave, um, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity uh, to plug any of your social medias um, where kind of students could find you and see some more of your stuff um, if you're interested. 
I'm ba- cool. I'm bad at social media, but my website is lesliedraws.com if you want to look at <laughs> some of my work. But I'm bad at social media. <laughs> Um, and, and my website is my name, michellecondrich.com. I am at Miss Illustrator on Twitter, at mcondrich on Instagram. I'm on TikTok, but I don't post all that much. It's mostly plant content, if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's me. And Leslie, do you want to mention your, your podcast? Oh, no, Michelle's podcast. What did I say? Oh, oh yeah, 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 Michelle. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I um I I'm not currently recording new episodes. It's called Creative Playdate. Um, I started it a few years ago. Uh, it's it's a podcast for um, people pursuing creative careers who are also raising children. Um, at the time that I started it, I felt like there was a real um, absence of advice for artists from people who are raising children, <laughs> because it's such a different you know, there's, you can't just work all night. You can't work 14 hours a day if you've, if you've got a kid at home. And so I felt like I was getting a lot of advice from like 25 year old guys without kids about how to be successful in illustration or in art careers. And it's like, well, a lot of that doesn't really apply. So I interviewed a lot of other uh, fellow illustrators who had small children. Um, I had, like I said, I haven't been recording new episodes. I, I started working for Georgetown and I just haven't had the time and space to continue it, but they're still up. There's, I think there's about 25 episodes. Um, so. And they remain. You're interested in me. <laughs> yeah. Remain well, <laughs> yes. Although I feel like we need some like pandemic updates because I don't know if you can hear my kids like, <laughs> doing God knows what in the background. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for, joining us here and, and thanks for having us Leslie and Michelle yeah. this and was really fun Sydney and Josie nice. for kind of uh, directing us some fun things to talk about yeah thank you all right see you thank later you everyone so night bye thank bye. you bye.